Hello, everyone, and welcome to Insights Now's Webinars Now. We are going to be talking about going behavioral with the implicit explicit test today. We are going to give just a moment. I see a whole bunch of people jumping on uh, right at the top of the hour, so I will start in just a couple of seconds. Well, welcome. Thank you for joining today. Today's webinar is on going behavioral with the implicit explicit test. And we're going to be talking today about how we correct for the factor that people always want to give the right answer to research. Uh, we, you know, people really want to make sure that they're they're helping out as much as possible. And sometimes they overthink their research answers uh, or the answers that they give in research. And so we want to make sure that we incorporate implicit, explicit uh, diagnostics within our research to be able to overcome some of the challenges and really understand what is implicitly top of mind on people's minds versus what are the types of things that they really have to think about. So with the implicit, explicit test, we get to see a lot of those things. I'm your host, Greg Stuckey, and I'm the Chief Research Officer at Insights Now. Insights Now provides behavioral research solutions for brand positioning, innovation product development, market messaging, all focused on getting your innovation to market faster and with greater in-market success. During the course of this webinar, you're welcome to uh, participate with us. There's a little chat window on the right-hand side. You're welcome to fill out questions that you have as you go th through the session, and I'll be addressing those questions at the end. So let's get going. Uh, first, we're gonna start with a little bit of science. So to understand implicit explicit, we need to understand a little bit of the psychology behind the research and understand uh, what is behind the, the framework, essentially, that builds into us understanding or having a test for implicit data and explicit data or implicit responses and explicit responses. So Insights now has a whole bunch of behavioral frameworks. We call these our behavior lens frameworks because they give you the lens of behavior for your research. These are not methods in and of themselves. They are learning tools. They are educational tools. The one we're gonna be focusing on today is called modes of thinking framework. And there are three modes of thinking. Most people are very familiar with two of them, which is what we're gonna be focusing on today, which is system one and system two, but there's also system three. So system one, system one shows our intuition. This is our automatic, super fast, unconscious. It's very autonomous response. This is really good when you wanna understand what things are happening super fast in a person's mind. If you wanna connect with habits, if you want to build good habits for people, and or you want to understand those subconscious cues that are in context that are triggering certain activities or behaviors or routines for people. System two, this shows how we process things. System two is our slow, effortful uh, thinking that is typically very controlled. It requires a bunch of energy, attention to detail, and but once it's engaged, it really helps you understand what was happening with the system one thought. So system two is really, really valuable for explaining why. Uh, it gives us insights into consumers' really feelings around how they explain things, how they make choices, uh, a lot about their heuristics, and it helps us understand why they're completing certain tasks the way they are. Now, system three is all about the future. And if you're interested in system three, we've got a prior webinar there, and you can see the link there on the screen. You can go to that and watch an entire webinar just on system three. But today our focus is going to be breaking apart system one and system two. System one being fast versus system two being slow. Unconscious versus conscious automatic versus effortful, typically for everyday decisions, very habitual versus very complex decisions, things you need to think about and consider. So our focus is really gonna be really in this fast versus slow area because in order to break apart system one and system two, we gotta understand what is a fast response and what is a slow response. So our goal is to really understand future behavior. 
So we want to understand if it's a system one reaction, that means whatever we're reacting to fits with our current perceptions and beliefs. It's something that's top of mind. It's likely tied to autonomous behavior. Whereas if it's a slow reaction, that's a much more explicit reaction. It's not really aligned with what we were thinking. It's not aligned with top of mind. So it's causing us to slow down. It's causing us to disrupt our current activities, which is really good if you're trying to actually disrupt people's current habits and get them to try something new. So understanding whether something's a fast connection or a slow connection or an implicit versus explicit connection will help you understand uh, how can you better design products, ideas, market messaging in order to deliver the best innovation to the market. So the real question is, what's a fast response? If we have to break apart fast versus slow, what's that tipping point? Well, one of the things we know is that everybody is unique and the speed at which their brains function as well as their physical uh, bodies function varies person to person and situation to situation. And we know a lot of factors play into how fast a person can react, their age, maybe their familiarity with the topic or the content, their physical function, their cognitive capabilities, the context or setting they're in amongst a large number of other things. So to understand what's a fast response, we've got to get personal. So we put in front of people a simple psychology test. And this psychology test is designed to be fit for the types of reactions we're reading that day. So if it's going to be a very short, quick uh, reaction, then we do a test that has just a single word in it. For instance, we give people an exercise like you see on the screen here. Here's the numbers, one through 10. Pick three of these numbers and remember which ones you picked. Now we're gonna show you those one at a time and we want you to answer, is it one you picked, yes or no? And you simply have to go through yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, as you go through that entire list of one through 10, which is gonna show up randomly. Now by looking at how fast they connect with those words, how fast they click, as well as whether they're getting that information right or wrong, we get to see uh, or build a model for cutoff times for people. Every one of those responses should have been fast, and we can see where's the variation in the data and where's the cutoff for fast for that person for that time. And if we look at cutoff times for people, we do see that person by person, there is a large amount of variation. And something that we would expect, like age being a factor, because we know dexterity is a, is a key indicator of ability to do fast and slow, reactions, we do see here, look at the distribution of cutoff times in seconds. Farther to the left is faster uh, cutoff times, uh, less seconds, and farther to the right is more seconds in a cutoff time. And you can see there's a, a, a the young people in that blue is the highest peak there. It, they are the fastest. They have the quickest cutoff times. Uh, older generations, uh, there are some that are very, very fast. So that's perfectly okay. You can't generalize here but tend to have also quite a few people who are much slower. So it's really important to personalize this metric. You can't just say 0 0.08 seconds, that's it. That's the fast cutoff time. That's how fast the brain works. That's nice, it's a mean, it's an average, but it doesn't help you in context. So step one, personalize the cutoff times. So how do we apply personalized cutoff times? Once I've done something, uh, or set your personal cutoff time, I can now show you a whole series of different types of tasks using that same approach, and I can understand whether your reaction to that uh, question that I'm posing is a fast response, a slow response, and whether you're positive or negative to it. So we apply this quite a bit with our Clean Label Enthusiast panel. This panel was group of people who are focused on having clean labels for their products. They're picking products. They're the people that always pick up the package and look at the ingredient statement. And they're looking for keywords. They're concerned about key ingredients. And so for us, we are using that group of people to help understand which ingredients in which context with which products uh, are going to be things that are positive for them, uh, promote clean label, things that are gonna be negative for them and make them concerned that the product isn't a clean label. Okay. When we do this, we break apart the data into four categories. So a person sees an ingredient like honey, 
they click yes that's clean or no that's not something uh, it's, it's something i would avoid and we break apart the fast responses the system one responses into fast positive as well as fast negative if it's implicitly a bad idea versus implicitly a good idea or implicitly something i'd avoid versus something i'm okay with those two data points are much more important when it comes to picking things quickly off the shelf than it is if you're in a system two setting, if there's a slow considered response. Right. So the same thing, system one, break apart four categories, system two, break apart into the two categories, total of four categories. So if we put these into a grid, what we can do is we can give them weighted values. So we can say a fast response, whether it's positive or negative, should get a higher weighting or a higher value than a slow response. In this case, what we're using with our clean label scoring is we're giving fast uh, avoid responses, fast negative responses, a negative one rating, uh, and fast okay responses, a positive one rating, and then a half rating for each of the slow responses. So if we look at an example, we can say, hey, 60% of the people said honey was a fast yes response, and 18 was a slow yes response. We can multiply it by those weights, apply the formula, get a score of 75 for honey. And uh, we can then compare, using that clean label score, we can then compare and contrast all the different types of ingredients in many different contexts or settings. So here you can see that, for instance, honey is one of those characteristics, or one, sorry, one of those ingredients, which gets a very high clean label score. People see it, they intuitively believe that that is going to uh, promote that product as being having a clean label. And you can see moving down this list of different types of sweeteners, stat tested against each other at the bottom is stevia, which gets on this list one of the lower scores. However, we also know that based on the context and based on the application, these ingredients uh, become either more valuable for promoting a clean label or less valuable. For instance, you can see here, the across the bottom is different types of applications. Notice how stevia in protein bars, protein powders, and ready to drink protein shakes gets a much, much, much higher clean label score than in yogurt. That means when people are picking up or seeing stevia on the label of a protein bar, it's much more likely for them to say, yeah, that's still a clean label. Whereas if they see it on a regular yogurt, they're thinking to themselves, no, this isn't a clean product. So understanding application, seeing the context effect here is going to is really important in doing your implicit and explicit research. Now it shouldn't surprise us that both age uh, or other consumer de demographics as well as context are significant players in helping us understand implicit versus explicit reactions. Because if we look at the fundamental behavior framework that we call the behavior pyramid where we're laddering up foundational elements to, uh, that are slow to change versus things that are faster to change, you can see that consumer qualities are the base. They change very slowly and they influence heavily the layer above them, which is the situational context. That changes less uh, quickly than a person's activities or modes of thinking, which is above it. So both consumer qualities and the context are highly influential on people's modes of thinking, what mindset they're in, how they react to things. So setting context, if it's really important, how do you do it? In research, it's pretty simple, especially since most research with implicit explicit testing is happening online. The simple way to do it is know what context you're going after and then have people tell their own personal stories about those contexts. So here we may have them tell about the last typical normal breakfast at home with a cereal. What did you choose? What was it about the cereal that made it uh, a good choice for that particular moment? So they're telling their story, they're immersing themselves in that situational context. And then we can take that and put it back right in front of them. So then when we ask the implicit explicit question where they're selecting okay or avoid, that context 
is the same context that they just told their story on. So they're primed with the moment, they're primed with the context, and then that's replicated back in front of them when they're getting the questionnaire. Okay. The other thing that we have to ask ourselves is what's the response, right? We had okay avoid with ingredients, and that makes sense for the type of question we're posing. But you can also say, hey, do you trust this? Do you not trust this? Is it a something you would do yes or no with colors? It was yes, no, or numbers and colors, it's yes, no, right? Is this a true statement, a false statement? Are you aware of this or not aware of this? It's important when you do your implicit explicit research that you prime people to know what those buttons are going to be. What are they going to actually get asked to respond with? Because uh, if you don't, then they're gonna spend a lot of time, remember time is being measured here, figuring that out. And so you want to make sure that you've done a good job up front of setting the context, which uh, speeds them along, and setting the task as well. So they're comfortable with the task, comfortable with the context, and now their only reaction is to the variables in the research. Okay. One of the ways implicit and explicit testing is becoming more popular and being used more and more often is with emotions. However, emotions pose a really interesting challenge because emotions are very, very fast and fleeting and they're always projected at some type of an object. The other thing that's really interesting is you can feel lots of emotions simultaneously and sometimes in very, very fast sequence as well. The problem is they happen so fast that you can't possibly measure all the different types of discrete emotions at that time they're actually occurring. And by the time you get around to measuring them, they're gone. So in order to overcome this challenge, we want to use visual projection. So this is a great classic, well-proven psychological technique for uh, allowing people to project their feelings onto some objects and then being able to recall those feelings against that particular object. So by focusing participants on a photo, on an image that is forced to be metaphorical for them, they can then, we can then bring that image back and have them respond to various types of discrete emotions and we'll capture a really good representation of their emotional reaction to the product that we were testing, okay? So it's fairly simple, four-step process. First is you give the stimulus and second thing is you immediately have them pick an image that relates to their experience with it, how it makes them feel, uh, in this case, I gave a fragrance as an example. If I have them smell a fragrance, how does this make you, uh, what are your thoughts and feelings about this fragrance? Boom, right away. Second, now describe it. Use your system two thinking to help me understand why you picked that, right? And then maybe even go into more detail. Describe the image itself. Give me the things about the image that were really important. So getting at some of those cues. And then finally now, bring them back to this implicit explicit test. Okay, now let's, instead of measuring your reaction to the fragrance, let's measure your experience and your projection of thoughts and feelings from this image. So is go through a series of discrete emotions. Is this something that makes you feel yes or no? Again, we're gonna break apart that data the same way we would have broken apart the clean label uh, example, fast yes, fast no, et cetera, so forth. However, with emotions, we're concerned about a little bit different type of information. With emotions, we really wanna understand those fast responses because that's the more emotional component piece. So a fast no, if it's a positive emotion like happy that I'm putting on there, I want a very low percentage of people saying, it doesn't make me feel happy. And uh, likewise for a fast yes, I want a high percentage of people saying, yes, that makes me feel happy if it's a positive emotion. Assuming I want people to feel happy with my product, of course. If it's on the negative side, you know, a fast no, but it's a negative attribute or a negative emotion, um, upset, angry. I wouldn't want very many people uh, upset or angry with my product, I'm assuming. So I would want a high percentage of people saying fast no for negative emotions. And I'm less concerned about the slow responses. 
in most emotions-based work, uh, the slow responses are going to be emotions. People go, I don't know what that emotion is. I kind of have to think about it a little bit. In those cases, it's more likely to be measuring confusion. And what we see in most research is that tends to stay static. There's a small group of people who uh, are not really sure about a lot of the key, you know, some of the key words. So if you show them a, an a emotional word that they're not as familiar with, they're more likely to be a slightly slow response to it. So let's take an example of emotions. Uh, think of a product trial, product taste test. Uh, this is a cereal taste test where there were five cereals and the cereals were being designed for a relaxing evening. So it's the ideal idea of a cereal as a treat at the end of the day where your goal is to relax. So we want to make sure that this is a really different experience than cereals in the morning where you might be having a goal to energize a person, right? So this is understanding the emotional profile. It's not just about whether I like the cereal or don't like the cereal or have the cereal or not, but it's about whether this cereal is one that helps me relax, helps me feel like I've been treated. If I then look at this, the data from this particular uh, piece of research, there were two cereals that created a lot of calming, this cereal B and cereal C, cereal B in green, cereal C in orange. And you can see that second bar there, there was a fairly high percentage of people, uh, not huge, but a fairly high percentage of people that said that both of those products were calming. And that was higher than any of the other products in the research. So what we see with this is cereal B, pretty close, not significantly different from Serial C, but a little bit higher on calming. But if you look across the attributes, you also see that Serial C uh, drives more energy, more excitement, more happiness. Uh, the question is whether that's a challenge. Is that something that you want in a cereal that relaxes you at the end of the day? Or is having that additional energetic excitement something that's actually taking away from the experience that you ultimately want to create? So from this data, I might say, well, cereal B, I'm going to hedge on the side of cereal B because they're both very, very similar. But I, want, I don't want to have all that extra energy uh, being uh, displayed, if you will, by the product. Now, if I look at other data, I can also look at the negative emotions, right? And if I'm looking at that fast yes and negative emotions, I want the smallest number possible here. So now I'm looking for low numbers. And one of the things you see is, well, now serial C, now I have a different piece of data. Serial C, there's fewer people that were disappointed with serial C than serial B. Hmm, well, I don't want people disappointed with my cereal, so maybe I'm gonna trade off. Maybe that energy is okay to have in there because I don't want as many people feeling disappointed. However, we can also look at the opposite. We can look at uh, the how many people said fast no for negative emotions, right? Did you feel this emotion? No, I didn't. That's something that I really want. So as expected, serial C, fewer or, or more people are saying, no, I definitely don't feel disappointed. However, if you look over on the right, there's an arrow there pointing to guilty. What's interesting is serial C makes a few more people feel guilty uh, and serial B is a little bit better at delivering against that. So options that we have coming out of this, I can maybe look at the characteristics of serial B and serial C and tweak a few so that I can take a little bit of the, little bit of the guilt out, maybe a little bit of the energy out of serial uh, C and get it to the place where it needs to be. So with most research that's implicit and explicit, we end up in the same situation where we're trying to make trade-offs between different types of emotional responses. And that's a really good place to be because you can see it's not as simple as which one was liked more. You're actually helping understand what type of an emotional reaction, what type of experience do I really wanna create for this person in this moment? And which of my prototypes or products or uh, component pieces are doing that for me? Now you can also, instead of bar graphs, uh, looking at bar graphs, you can also do correspondence mapping with this information. Uh, if you map this out, this helps people who are a little bit more visual see where different uh, products fall. You can see 
that serial C sits up there in that top right. Remember, it had a little bit more energy, a little bit more excitement, so it's being pulled away visually up there. Uh, serial C, which was in that calming, you know, heavy calming, that's sitting closer to the calming area, but it's kind of in the middle, right? It doesn't have any uh, other characteristics or emotions that are pulling it uniquely away. And you can see the other serials here. Some were, had a little bit higher negative profiles, uh, et cetera, so forth. So in this particular case, uh, this is another way if you're much more of a biplot kind of person or a visual kind of person that you can show this information in an interesting way and find new patterns as well. The other thing that's nice about this is you can see what types of emotions group together for that particular product set. All right, now, in understanding the implicit reactions, that's super, super valuable, but remember, we're breaking apart system one and system two. You want that system two information to help you make good decisions. So we were sitting there with just the implicit data trying to make trade-offs. So do I want it a little bit more, is guilt okay? What about disappointment? How should I fix this? Maybe I wanna tweak the product. Well, in order to understand where to go next, you want a little bit of that system two information. So we go to the open ends and we look at the types of open ends people are talking about here. So if I wanted to tweak serial B, maybe I'm gonna go to the uh, people who said, yes, I was implicitly feeling calm. And what, would, what kinds of things were they reacting to? Was it the chips? Was it the texture? Was it maybe uh, something about the visual of the product uh, versus serial C? Is there something in there that tells me maybe there's something about this product that I could tweak or I could leverage or I could modify that would enhance or detract from the calming aspect that I'm ultimately going after. Okay. Now, the other great thing about implicit explicit testing is we can look at other types of data, not just the emotional reaction, not just necessarily a specific ingredient, but we can also look at the marketing and messaging around this. Because remember, when we put products on the market, they're holistic, right? You have the, the way the product is pitched, the package that it's in, you have the types of claims being made. And here on this screen is an example of the claims. If we wanna look for these, this suite of serial products at the different types of claims that you could make, which of these claims would be more likely to be very, very intuitive to people versus which ones are gonna be more likely to be dis disruptive to people? So whereas uh, with breakfast cereal, we see that you know, the whole grain movement is a very uh, strong, valuable piece. When it comes to breakfast cereals as a evening treat, Notice that contains whole grains is all the way down at the bottom, right? There were not very many fast responses. There's a lot of people going, oh, I have to think about that a little bit. Um, yeah, I guess it's okay, but uh, not very relevant to me in this particular situation, right? Whereas in the top right, the GMO free, verified non-GMO and high protein, those were much more implicit and much more relevant. So it might be claims that you would uh, use to uh, help promote this particular product line if you could make them. Okay. Other applications, you can also look at specific brands. So maybe I'm building these cereals, but I haven't decided which brand I wanna put it against, right? Which brand uh, is going to have more awareness for this line? Which one is going to more be a more natural fit for this line? Uh, also can be done there. So if you're looking at different brands, the implicit awareness, that ind indicates that instant recognition, bam, it fits really, really well. The explicit, people have to think about it a little bit. Not necessarily a bad fit, but it's be something that you would have to put more marketing into, more education into, in order to eventually make that an implicit connection for people. Okay. So where does this fit in your research? Implicit, explicit testing can fit lots of different ways. Uh, showed a few examples here. It fits in filtering and screening new ideas, claims, uh, potential behaviors you wanna target. It fits in concept testing, concept screening. You just have to set the uh, context and the time uh, calculations up differently for those bigger concepts. Uh, ingredients label testing, of course, we're doing that a lot with our clean label group. Uh, within product testing, as you saw here, uh, especially when you want to engage emotional reactions and those subconscious impacts that something might have. Uh, it could be ingredients or some other characteristic of your product, it could be packaging related as well. 
when you're doing brand assessments, brand tracking, if you're doing market message impact, whether a uh, certain icon that maybe you're developing or a certain look or context that you're setting within a certain ad is going to be an implicit connection and fit or not, as well as ad recall and add value to people. So whether people can remember your ad well and remember your brand associated with that particular ad as well. So all these different areas, great places for the implicit explicit test. It's a tool, it can be applied in many, many different areas. To summarize everything up, there can really be a lot of value in that implicit information. In the blink of an eye, we get a lot of wonderful value, but we have to be able to capture that blink of an eye. And I hope I've been able to show you a little bit about how you can put together implicit, explicit in a way that's very, very fast for research. It's quick and easy to apply pretty much anywhere you've been going and, uh, and really can benefit and help you understand what kind of trade-offs you're building into the different types of product builds and message builds that you have. All right, with that, any questions for today? So go ahead and type in your questions into the question set and I'll start going through those and seeing, uh, answering those as we get through. Let's see, just have a few coming in here. All right. What kind of sample size do we typically use for this kind of testing? Sample size for this, uh, typically you can get uh, really good information with about 100 responses. Uh, so typical sample size to any other uh, check all that apply style question. If you think about this as a very categorical piece of information for you, uh, everything's broken down into those four cells. So it's very similar if information, if you will, to a yes, no question or a, or a single select question. So standard sample sizes of, uh, of 100 if you're looking at something very focused. Uh, if you're trying to do something more broad with a bigger group of people like market testing, claims testing, you wanna go to 200, 300 people to make sure that you can slice and dice your data to the various subsets of people. Okay. That's actually several people asking that question. That's a really good question. Okay. Um, Next question, thank you for typing up, appreciate it. Next question, do you see a lot of differences uh, in, the, in the different types of devices being used? So I'm assuming you're talking about um, like mobile, if people are on like an iPad or if they're on taking surveys from their desktops. Actually, we, we don't see very much difference. That actually was a surprise to us. Uh, we have a huge amount of data on, on that. And, and me personally, I was like, oh yeah, I feel like I can take this a lot faster on, on my smartphone than I can on my computer using a mouse. But we actually don't see that. That very, very minimal differences. There are for sure going to be person by person differences. However, as a general rule, the device, it's pretty much device agnostic. And because every single person is going to be taking their calibration, as long as they stay on the same device all the way through the test, uh, you're gonna be just fine. Uh, their, their time isn't gonna shift or change. Can you combine this with the standard overall liking or other system two questions? Absolutely. You can incorporate this if you're doing just about right scales, if you're doing other types of liking, in fact, one of the reasons we love this is because in a lot of research, you get multiple products with the same liking score or not significantly different in liking, but they are significantly different on certain types of emotions or certain types of uh, fit to concept type reactions, which are implicit versus explicit. So that's a really good one as well. Uh, was actual tasting involved in the COM serial test? Yes, it, in that particular case it was, and that's the value of the projective exercise. You go and you, you taste the cereal and you have that full experience and you are picking an image during that moment while you're in first taste. And 
so that image then ca is capturing, you're projecting all your emotions onto that particular image. And then we can bring that image back and test the emotional reaction against that. And uh, much, much uh, easier, especially because in, in this case, especially in most product taste tests, it's blinded, right? You don't have, or uh, you don't have a lot of different brands, or if you have a brand, it's the same brand across the board. So when in those blind situations, uh, that's really, really helpful to, to have that projective exercise as well. All right, but you can, if you just wanna do this implicit test against the images or the concepts, that's absolutely capable uh, or possible if you're interested in doing that as well. But it does definitely work where you're doing the a full taste test or a full product experience uh, as well. Uh, if you're doing a longer product experience where they're gonna prep something or open something and you may wanna break up the test or segment your group so that you can capture emotions of a certain aspect of that research, that would also be uh, a valuable add. All right, well with that, I don't see any more questions coming through. So thank you all for your time today. I appreciate that. Next webinar is coming up next month. It is going to be on clean label and the new trust economy. So we're gonna be talking about trust uh, and how clean labels and brands are connected via people's ability to have trust for that brand and how that relates to people's clean labels. So join us, it's gonna be Thursday, April 4th, same time of day as this one was, which is 2 p.m. Eastern. Really appreciate your time today and always ask questions if you have any and, and have a wonderful afternoon.